This is Business Law, Section 3, Chapter 7. In Section 3, we're going to be learning about consumer law. Um, there are three chapters, the Consumer Law and Contracts. Chapter 8 is Personal Property, and Chapter 9 is Renting or Owning a Home. This section is going to be dealing with the rules that govern contracts for the sale of goods and the remedies available when such contracts are breached. We will investigate the ways in which the law protects the consumers, including with respect to personal property as well as renting or owning a home, from unfair or deceptive practices and can allocate liability. Chapter 7 is Consumer Law and Contract. The Consumer Protection Laws applies to transactions between consumers and businesses. This chapter is going to focus on the product safety, warranties, and forms of deceptive practices. You're going to learn about the responsibilities of buyers and sellers in merchandising transactions. Consumer Protection Laws were created in order to safeguard consumers against unfair, unsafe, and deceptive selling practices. Have you ever purchased a product that was unsafe? Or have you ever purchased a product that was not exactly the way it was described? If you would read page 160, um, the Business Week New Many Not So Happy Returns, we can pause the video while you do that. Okay, so in some cases, consumers are guilty of attempting to manipulate the consumer system. Students that, okay, so a store ret has return policies that require specific things, such as Walmart, you have to take the receipt. If you don't have a receipt, you have to have an ID, and you're only allowed to take so many returns without a receipt within a 12 month period. Um, some will allow only exchanges, some will allow a store credit, and if you are getting a cash refund, that's usually stated on your store receipt. Some stores also reserve the right to decline a return simply on the basis that a particular customer has returned merchandise too frequently. That's what Walmart's trying to do whenever they're not letting you make as many returns um, without having the receipts in those. One of the objectives of the consumer protection laws is to protect the buyers from dangerous products or fraudulent selling. This would deal with products that are unsafe. You've heard of recalls. Um, there's lots of recalls been on vehicles. Sometimes there's recalls on, I've seen them on high chairs, on cribs, things like that, because an item is safe. Or sometimes it just has false advertising. It claims it's going to do something, but then it really doesn't. When you are reading an advertisement, you need to make sure that you're reading it um, for everything that's in it. For example, if an advertisement is for a weight loss product, it may say lose weight more quickly than you ever imagined, or works for everyone, or no dieting ever required. Certain red flags qualify, certain red flag qualifiers and terms that signal false claims. Because if there's no dieting ever required, then how are you going to lose weight? Many times you'll see in the fine print that it will list exclusions, exceptions, date requirements, and qualifications for receiving the advertised product or price. For example, I've seen an advertisement for, I think it's Total Gym, you can get it for $14.95 for 30 days. Well, in the fine print, it is not just $14.95. It's $14.95, they ship you the product, but then after 30 days, you either need to then ship the product back at your expense or you're going to have to pay the full price for the item. Okay, 7-1 is sales contracts. And in this one we're going to start by talking about the sale of goods. General contract law governs the contracts for such things such as real estate, employment, and services. However, there is contract law, which is sales law, and this governs the sale of goods. It does not apply 
to real estate or services, which is houses and land, and it also does not apply to work performed by someone else. So this is basically the sale of items, like you go to the store and you purchase an item. It was established through the customs and practices of many business people, merchants, and mariners, and it has gone through many changes. One thing that's important to know is that in, as interstate commerce, what is interstate commerce? Like an interstate highway, it is commerce that moves between state lines. As interstate commerce developed over the years, the need arose to make uniform the many commercial laws affecting the sales among states. Before that, every state could deal with their laws for sales the way they wanted to. However, you know, if you go to Iowa and buy something, you would expect the laws there to be very similar to the laws you would find in Missouri. And so we have de developed what's called the Uniform Commercial Code, or the UCC, and that is the collection of laws that governs various types of business transactions. You are applying this law whenever you have a contract for the sale of goods. So what are goods? Well, we already said that it's not real estate and it is not services. Goods are movable. So it does not include money, it does not include stocks, and it does not include bonds. Other than that, almost everything else is considered a good. So take a few seconds and in your notes, go ahead and write down two or three goods that you can think of. Some examples that you might have come up with would be your clothing, your books, the cell phone, food, car, even the gas you put in the car. The sales contract in which the ownership of goods is transferred from the seller to the buyer for a price. So every time you buy something, the UCC is coming into effect. What about if you're going to lease an item? The sale of goods is also going to apply in that case. So every time you, if you went to Redbox and you rented a DVD, you're still going to be under the UCC. Anytime that goods and services are included, so for example, um, you bought something and had a service done. So if you had your oil changed, you're paying for the service of having the oil changed, but in the meantime, you're also buying oil and an oil oil filter, things such as that. So when you have both goods and services included in the same transaction, it's going to be whatever the dominant element is. So if I bought three new computers and had them installed, my computers is my sale of goods, and installation would be a service, while the price of the three computers is going to be more, is going to be higher than that of the installation, so in that case, it's going to be considered a sale of good, and the UCC will apply. There are some special rules for sales contracts. A sales contract must contain the same elements as any other contract that we have talked about in the previous section. However, the UCC has relaxed some of the strict rules of contract law, which is good because we've talked about every time you go in and you buy um, a soda at the convenience store, that is actually entering into a contract even though you didn't speak, perhaps. Um, so they have relaxed some of the rules applying to this. The first one is the methods of dealing and the usage of trade. When you've dealt with another person before, the method you use to deal with them has special meaning. So whatever is commonly used in your particular area, area or in that particular trade is going to apply. So it means basically you're doing it the way you've always done it. If you want to do something different, then you need to specifically state that it's going to be done in a different way. Good faith means that each party must treat each other fairly. That's only the right way to act. So we want to act in good faith. When you're dealing with the offer and the acceptance, um, we talked about how in contract law the offer may be oral or in writing, and it's the same thing here. It could be oral or it could be in writing. There are a few exceptions of things that are required to be in writing, 
However, most things can be just orally said. And it is going to, your contract's going to come into existence at the time the acceptance is sent within a reasonable manner, just as we talked about in the previous chapter. Next is a firm offer. So the UCC is going to hold merchants to a higher standard than non-merchants. That's pretty important because as a merchant, you should know how to do business. If you're just a customer coming in, that is not necessarily your expertise. The merchant is considered a business or a person who deals regularly in the sale of goods or has a specialized knowledge in those goods. So the firm offer would be the merchant's written promise to hold an offer open for sale or lease of goods. When this happens, we've talked about how if there's an offer, there's an acceptance, and there must be consideration. However, in this case, no consideration is necessary, and the merchant cannot revoke the firm offer during the time stated in the offer or for a reasonable time if none is stated. However, there is a limit on three months is the longest you can have this. So, for example, if you see um, a flyer that says, sale good through Saturday, that means they have to hold that sale open through Saturday. Now there are exceptions in their fine print is where they always put those and you might see where it says while supplies last. So that means even though it's not Saturday, if they have ran out of the supply that they had intended to sell through their sale, then, then the sale is over. And acceptance may add different or additional terms. And these are going to be treated as proposals for an addition to the contract if both parties are not a merchant. However, if both parties are merchants, then the change will become part of the contract unless they are major or the offerer objects. So basically what that's saying, as long as there's a minor change, it does not have to be in written if you're dealing between two merchants. So let's say I ordered 20 pairs of blue socks. The, the vendor I'm ordering from calls me up and they said, well, we don't have the dark blue socks like you wanted, but we do have the light blue socks. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and send me the light blue socks. I'll sell those. There's not much difference between them anyway. So we do not actually have to put that in writing because it's not a major change to our original contract. And that is something different than from regular contract law. Statute of limitations we've talked about before. Statute of limitations is whenever time has run out after so long. You've only got so long to make a claim. And for a sales contract, it is four years. However, as individual parties, you can reduce that time period to a minimum of one year, but you cannot go past four years. And the time is going to begin as soon as the breach occurs. So you only have four years from the time of a breach to try to resolve your matter. And next, the form of a sales contract. So if the sale price of a good is less than $500, then it is okay that it is oral, and it is enforceable at that. If the price is more than $500, you need to have that contract in writing. There are a couple times whenever this rule does not apply. That would be when there is written confirmation of an oral contract and it is sent within a reasonable time. If the contract involves specially manufactured goods, it cannot easily be sold. So maybe I'm ordering a t-shirt that has my name on it. Well, even though the contract is for less than $500, it should be in writing because if I do not fulfill my end of the contract by paying for the t-shirts, it's not like they're going to be able to sell t-shirts that have my name on them to someone else. If the buyer receives and accepts the goods or pays for them, or if the parties admit in court that they entered into an oral contract. So if it was more than $500 and the buyer goes ahead and receives them and accepts the goods and they pay for them, you do not have to go back and write out a contract for it. Or if both parties go to court and they said, yeah, we agreed, but we didn't have it in writing, then once you admit it in court, it's the same as it being in writing. So when does title 
passed from the seller to the buyer. So when do you actually take ownership of a good that you are buying? First of all, there's some vocabulary words you need to know. The title. That is the right of ownership to goods. Probably the most, um, the first place that comes to your mind is the title of a vehicle. The title shows you have the right to ownership. The second is a bill of sale, and this is formal evidence of ownership. Even though it's formal evidence of ownership, it does not prove that you own it. You may have a bill of sale for purchasing a car, but all that does is proves that you once had the title. The bill of sale, you could have sold it to someone else and passed the title to them. However, you still have your bill of sale, so it only proves that you once had the title. You need to know a voidable title. This is one that may be voided or canceled if the injured party so decides to do so. Oh, I skipped one. It's not even in your notes but it is in your book if you want to check it out on page 165. That is an insurable interest. This is a legal interest in the protection of property from injury, loss, or destruction. Who would have an insurable interest in a piece of merchandise? Well, the buyer has an insurable interest when the specific goods as identified in the contract. So the seller must maintain insurance on those items until the title has passed to the buyer, and at that time, then the buyer needs to do that. But the seller has to keep insurance on that because, because the buyer wants those items exactly as described. And if they are not fulfilled, then it may be up to the seller to compensate them some other way. Okay, now down to avoidable title. Anyone who obtains property as a result of another person's fraud, mistake, undue influence, or duress will hold only voidable title to the goods. This means that the title may be voided or canceled if the injured party so chooses to do so. So if you received goods that were bought from or sold to a minor or a person who is mentally impaired, that means that the minor who has bought the goods can void the title, just like in regular contract law. Now, the person who sold the goods, even though they were doing everything fine, they cannot get out of it and change their mind. It's only up to the injured party to decide to get out of it. When does the passage of title and risk of loss move? Sometimes you have to decide who has title to the goods, the seller or the buyer, and who bears the risk of loss for those goods. So for example, you've ordered something, it's been shipped, and it is damaged on its way to you. Who actually owns the goods? Does the seller still own the goods? Or do you, the buyer, now own the goods? Well, the passage of title is when the seller has done what is required. Um, so for example, if you ordered a pair of shoes, the seller shipped them through the post office, as soon as they take them to the post office, it is no longer their responsibility. It is no longer their shoes. As soon as they go to the post office, it is now the, sell, the buyer's pair of shoes. So if you're have, ordering something and the seller says, do you want to insure that? Yes, you do, because it is now your item. One thing to note, um, you cannot have a title to goods that don't yet exist. So if you, I heard some people talking the other day, it's fun to go online, design your dream car on the website, see how much money you can put into it. Well, if you did that and actually ordered the car like you were going to intend to pay for because you had that much money, um, you don't have title to those goods yet. So that truck you, you built online and you have ordered, you cannot have a title to it even if you have made a down payment because the goods do not yet exist. So finally, shipment and destination contracts, title and risk of both will pass to the buyer as soon as the seller gives it to the carrier or the delivery company, just like I talked about before. Okay, remedies for breach of a sales contract. So what do you do if you have a sales contract 
and the other party does not fulfill their end of it. Well, as a seller, there are a few things you can do. If the buyer refuses the goods or refuses to pay for them, you have some options. Sometimes um, you have created the goods, you have taken them there, the buyer says, no, I don't want them, and they refuse to take them, you can just simply cancel the contract. That's an easy way to do it. Okay, you're not going to pay me for them. I'm not going to give you the stuff. Contract's over. We both go on our merry, happy way. That's the easiest. You can also withhold delivery. And that's just exactly what it says. Until you pay me, I am not going to deliver the products you've ordered. If you have already shipped them, you can stop delivery of the item. So you can call up the UP man and say, hey, don't deliver the package that I'm sending to Fred because he has told me he is not going to pay for it. Please hold that package. What if you have created something custom for another person? Or not custom, but you've created something and you have had it made. You have then sent it to the buyer and the buyer has refused them or refused to pay for them. Your option is you can resell it to someone else for a different price. If the original value of that item was $500 and all you can get for it is $200, then you get your $200 for reselling it and that $300 difference, you can then sue the buyer for the difference of that. If the item is, cannot be resold, for example, it's a custom piece, um, you can bring a claim against the buyer for the difference between the agreed upon price and the market price. You can also sue the buyer for any goods that the buyer accepted. So if the buyer went ahead and accepted their package and then they refused to pay, you can sue them for the total. Now you're the buyer. So you're the buyer and the seller is refusing to deliver what you wanted or they deliver the wrong stuff or it's damaged or a defective item. Some things you can do. Again, cancel the contract. Say, eh, this isn't what I ordered. I'm not taking these. I'm not paying for them. We're all good. You and the seller both agree to cancel. If you've already paid for the item, you can bring a claim for the return of the money. You know, I already paid you $20 for this. This is not what I wanted. I want my money back. You can bring a claim for the difference between the agreed upon price and the market price refuse to accept the goods. You can buy a similar good from someone else and bring a claim for the difference. So I was going to buy this item from you for $50. Well, you did not fulfill the part. You did not deliver it. So what I can do is I can find the same item, but now I'm going to have to pay $75 for it. So I guess I'll pay them the $75, but I'm going to sue you for $25 because that's how much it cost me in addition to what I had planned on paying for it. If they have shipped the item, one way to do it is to accept the goods. Go ahead and notify the seller of the problem. A lot of times your seller is going to fix the problem. Weston just had that happen the other day. If the seller doesn't fix it, then you can sue them for breach of contract or warranty. And finally, you can revoke the acceptance and return the goods if there is a serious defect that was undetectable or if you were led to believe that the seller would fix the problem and then they are not going to. Wrong place. Okay, that is the end of section 7.1. Um, for your homework, you need to go ahead and do questions 1 through 3 and the math.